All right. Hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is April 9th, 2021. Counting down the days, watching, praying always that we will be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Yet, if he calls us to work, we will be ready and waiting as well. Man, brothers and sisters, today's video is going to be exciting. It's going to be deep. It's going to be heavy. And it's going to be awesome. <laughs> I, I, for this one, I even had to make notes for it. I had, uh, I had a, a shower moment last night uh, in relation to the first part of this video. Uh, I, I had planned on this video being all about the the other baptism and and delving just into this revelation of the difference in the baptisms, of which I am going to bring you some incredible new insight and and in relation to understanding what these differences are, why the book of Hebrews tells us one time in all the scripture the word baptisms. And and what it reveals when we get started here, you're going to see that's where we're going to start today's video. And right off the bat, you're going to see in the first six verses, it's just going to blow your mind. And what it reveals. So as I was as I was planning the 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 baptisms video and and breaking it down. I saw the wording there and I said, oh, my goodness. Are you kidding me? There it is again. There it is again. And this was last uh, last night or even the, during the day yesterday, maybe even the night before. And then I was praying last night and and as my, you know, in my shower, I take long, long showers and they're usually between like 12 and 1, 1 a.m. <laughs> so no, everybody's asleep in the house and I'm just in my quiet time with the Lord and I had something strike me. And you'll notice I didn't mean to say that on purpose, but it works out well because the first half of this video, you see the video name is probably something like Two Strikes and the Other Baptism. All right. It was supposed to be just the baptisms. But as I started looking into the baptisms, like I said, this whole thing about Two Strikes jumped out at me again. And I, I was going to mention this later, but there's there's a a video I've been planning and working on in the background for for a long time. I've already I already understand it, but it's just a matter of sitting down and planning it out. And it relates to the Gospel of John and with Hebrews, maybe a little bit with Genesis as well, but in particular a focus with John and John's Gospel and in particular the last 7 chapters, all right? Or the last eight chapters from about 14 through to 20. You can say 21, but not really. It's It would be the, the trumpets period that relates to the Gospel of John. And there's very, very interesting wording. And in the first portion of today's video, when we get into this, you're going to begin to see exactly what I'm talking about. You guys are going to be, your, your jaws are going to hit the floor and you're going to say, oh my goodness, there it is. Many of you who have been following this and and seeing these little tidbits of this being dropped uh, throughout the past year and a half or so, you're going to begin to see it even more clearly. And and how it ties into the baptisms and, and the information connected to it is, is amazing. It really, really is amazing. And when you see the person involved and where he's mentioned in the Old and in the New Testament, in particular in the new, you're going to understand the second strike. It's craziness, guys. It really is. It's sad. It's painful. But you're going to begin to see it even more clearly for yourselves. So without any further ado, yeah, I've got some, I made some notes on this one because I've got so much I want to cover. So let's get into this. And let me start with the way I always do. And that is for everybody to go to the playlists. All right, to understand, this is one of our brothers in a video that he did. <laughs> I spoke about him briefly in the last video. Oh, look at that, 222 likes. There it is again, you know, just never stops. 
So uh, remember, I always bring these up, and I bring these up for a reason, guys, because we always have new people. If, <laughs> I'm sorry to say, but if anybody is new, brand new coming across this video, and you haven't understood anything else in this ministry yet, all of the revelations that have come to pass, you are going to be scratching your head saying, what? All right. What you need to do, you really need to do, if you want to understand the end day, the end of time, the end days, sorry, the end times, the the biblical end of days, as you've never understood them before, and 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 understand questions, have answers to questions that you will have had probably for decades, some of you, and that is who the gospels are speaking to. Why why are there these differences in the gospels? How does this all fit into seven years for the tribulation? There's the Antichrist, there's Satan. Are they two? Are they the same? How, uh, what about the Christian time? What about all of these things will begin to be answered for you just by watching these two first 30 minute videos? They're the introduction to who the Gospels are speaking to, and there's a PDF printout in the description box below. And the 14 years you're going to see in this who the Gospels are speaking to you're going to come to understand that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic gospels, in the end of days, go Luke, Mark, and Matthew. Luke is to the bride of Christ, the gorgeous, bright, radiant robe. Mark is the sleeping church with purple. And Matthew is the uh, uh, is Judah and is the scarlet, all right, that Jesus was arrayed in. You'll begin to understand why there's all these differences within the gospels and what they mean, how things have been confused and in, in, in misunderstood, they will begin to be revealed to you if you watch this first 30-minute video. When you watch this second 30-minute video, your mind's going to be blown because you're going to say, what again? And the reason you're going to is because all of our life we've been told the tribulation is seven years. The truth is there are two sets of seven years in the end of days, six and the seventh, six and the seventh, just like God's law. One is going to be for that sleeping church that wasn't ready. And the second one is the one that everybody has come to understand, which is Jacob's trouble, the, the portion for Judah. But how did the first seven years get missed? Come and watch this third, this third video, this full video here, and you're going to understand why it was missed. And the reason it was missed was because we have all been taught the gospel from the foundation of Matthew. And Matthew is not for us. It has nothing to do with us. It is written to Judah. So being taught all of our lives for generation after generation from the gospel of Matthew, we see everything from the perspective as if we're at the end of Mark. Meaning we've missed all of Mark and Luke. <clears throat> Excuse me. That's what you will come to understand in this revelation. And it's going to blow your mind when you do. So take the time in these videos. And then you want to get really excited? Come and watch this one, pre, mid, and post. You're going to understand that all three of them are true. This debate, whether it's pre-trib or whether it's mid-trib or it's at the Lord's return, all three of them are true. It's the escape of the bride of Christ or like a rapture to the bride of Christ that goes at the beginning, pre-trib, and which is about to happen. It's going to be spring of 2021. And then you've got the mid-trib, which is at the end of seals or after six years of seals in the seventh year. That is going to be the rapture of the sleeping church that's now woken up, having cleansed their robes during the tribulation. And in trumpets, as the post-trib, that is when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives. So there's an escape like a rapture. There is the rapture, and then there's his return. And the revelation of all of this is 2 Corinthians 12. Go read it for yourselves. Above 14 years, like a rapture to the third heaven. The second time it was, was a rapture and they go to paradise. And he says, the third time I am coming to you. That, brothers and sisters, is absolute, crystal clear, 100% revelation of pre, mid, and post. All right? So, everybody needs to watch that if you're brand new, all right? And understand what these differences are. The second thing everybody can do is you can come to ministryrevealed.com. This is our website. And you could either buy the new book that we just completed in March, 
You can get it on ebook or you can get a paperback. I recommend everybody get the paperback so that they've got it to leave or to give to others. But if you can't afford it or you're such in a remote area, download the PDF. It is free. All right. You don't have to buy the book at all. I don't care if you buy the book, except that you've got something to leave for people. You can freely download all of the pages if you want, 200 and some odd pages. All right, but it might be cheaper to buy the book if you can. And you can also download the audio of the book. The book covers the Gospels revelation, the 14 years, the pre, mid, and post, uh, uh, the, the seven churches in the end of days revealed in, in the mystery that people have been seeking for generations or for decades, generations, really. The revelation of the Gospels, uh, sorry, of the seven churches, and on and on. You can also click here and you could read the book here on the Ministry Revealed website. Or while you're there, you can convert the book on the website and read it in over 40 languages. All for free. All right. Only this is a dollar or like eight something US. All right. That's it. But you don't even need to pay. Other than that, man, you can come in here. You can click the menu button. You can join the forum. There's over 700 people we have in the forum that are sharing, that are praying for each other, that are lifting each other up, that are asking questions, sharing what they find, sharing news articles, watching events globally. Anybody can come in there, join, answer a question, and boom, you're in. It'll take you seconds. All right? So if you want to be connected with like-minded individuals, and seeking, watching, and praying for the Lord until you can come in here, click the forum button once you're in there, and join us. And this I haven't spoken about in the last little bit. I'm not sure how many are left, but anybody who would like a free, it's a $10 Bible memory app that has been covered. We had 250 of them. I don't know how many are left. All you do is click activate now. Once you're there, on the first line, you're going to enter it exactly as you see here, all in caps, no spaces, ministry revealed. And in the second line, you're going to put in your own email address, and then you're going to see another activate, and you're going to click that, and you're going to receive the free Bible memory app. We don't get paid for it. It's nothing like that. It's that I know many of you would be would love to have greater memory with your with your Bible verses and so forth, especially in how we teach things here. This will help you do that. All right? So with that, let me close that one out. All right, so let's get going into this now because this, <laughs> as I told you guys, is going to be awesome. All right, we are going to start in Hebrews chapter 1. You see, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2, it's the only place we have the word baptisms. And when you see this and where this starts to take us, it's really, really going to, you're just going to freak out. All right, especially those who have been watching for a while and and following along with all these revelations. It's incredible. So first of all, we, we've got this strange thing within a couple of verses. Let's read verse 1 and 2 first. Hebrews 6, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, right off the bat, that's strange, right? Let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on the hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Okay? I'm not going to go on and read the rest because you guys are going to be like, what? Again? No! <laughs> All right? So what are we seeing here? But we're going to get to it in a bit. What are we seeing here? Well, first of all, maybe we should establish something because you guys got to remember something. We here in this ministry have been given end time eyes. All right. We have eyes to see these scriptures and all of these open books that we've come to understand with an understanding of what they're telling us in the end of days. And that within the chapters of many of the books, they relate as a type and shadow of events within years of those end days, 14 years, seven of seals and seven of trumpets. So now let's go look at this 
And you'll see that we broke this down, that the book of Hebrews is one of those books that we've broken down over a 13-year period, okay? It would go to the end corresponding to when the Lord returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, and it begins here in chapter 1. So if we are at chapter 6, in our end-time understanding, chapter 6 is what? Sometime relating to the, the sixth year of seals. And when we see this, it doesn't mean that the events in the chapter, sometimes they can relate to the beginning of a year that, they, that they're corresponding to. Sometimes it could be something in the middle. Sometimes it could be something throughout the entirety of the year. And in other times, it could relate to right towards the end of the year. Okay? So we're looking at Hebrews 6 in the end time eyes, realizing that it's speaking to the sixth year of seals. Okay? So let's keep that in mind as we're looking at this. Watch this. It says, Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. First of all, perfection means completeness. Okay? Completeness, to be complete, of full age. Now, let me ask you, what completeness, what full age do we have at the end of the six years of seals? That's right. The end of the age of the Gentiles. The end of the age of the Gentiles. And who comes at the end of the sixth seal? Right? At the end of the sixth seal, at the end of six years of seals, who do we see coming at the end of the sixth seal? But the one who they say hideth from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb for the great day of his wrath has come. So him who sits on the throne and the Lamb. Okay, so we know Jesus is coming. Jesus is going to be seen coming at the end of the sixth seal, which is the period of completeness, the fullness of the time of the Gentiles coming to an end. Okay, so that's the bit of what's starting to take place here. When we read a little bit more, it says, not laying again. So it's saying, look, we're, we're going to move past this now because the perfection, this completeness of age is done. And we're no longer going to lay again the foundation of repentance. This is amazing. Okay, the foundation of repentance. Guys, how many times have I explained that those who are going to be chosen to work during the times of seals to bring in that sleeping church, that they are the foundation layers. They are the ones who will be laying the foundation and they are a group that's chosen from Luke, from out of Luke's group, the escape happens and a group is going to be chosen to work the time of seals. All right, during this apostolic age, this, this time of greatest revival and great tribulation or, or an incredible tribulation, which is World War III and all of these things, the Antichrist coming once it gets going, everything. Okay, a very terrible time. This group is called the foundation layers. And we know that there's going to be a physical foundation laid during the time of seals, but that it is also a representation of a spiritual foundation. All right? And it's telling us not laying again the foundation. Meaning what? The foundation has already been laid. It doesn't say not, laying, not, not putting up the walls. It doesn't say the, the gates. It only says the foundation. And it says the foundation of repentance, which I'm going to show you is going to blow your mind as well. So this foundation, if we go look up the information on the foundation, look at what we find. If we just type in, so it's the, the word foundation, okay? So you've got it in, in the Hebrew, but we're looking in the Greek. So we see that it shows up twice in Matthew, no in Mark, none in Mark, uh, four times in Luke, and one in John. But check this out. When it talks about the foundation in the New Testament, in Matthew, it's always about the foundation of the world, the foundation of the world. 
when we come into Luke, it's all about the foundation being laid, the foundation on a rock. The found, with a foundation built upon, uh, uh, built a house upon the earth. But in 11, it says the foundation of the world. In 14, it's about him building the foundation and they'd mock if he couldn't finish his job. And then in John, you see again, foundation of the world. So in John's gospel, it's foundation of the world. One out of four in Luke is foundation of the world. And the two found in Matthew are both foundation of the world. Well, do you know that the foundation being spoken about here is the one that's the Greek word 2310. And it has nothing to do with the one about the foundation of the world. Check it out. Greek word 2310. Luke, Luke, Luke. The two from Matthew and the one from John are gone. It's a specific foundation being spoken about that's being laid. What foundation is it? It's the one we were just showing to you here in Hebrews 6, having already been laid. Why is it already being laid? Why is it being showed to us like that? Because Hebrews 6 is at the end of six years of seals, in which time the foundation will have already been laid. You want to see where else it's talked about? Look at it right here. Revelation 21, 14 and 19. Does that sound familiar to some of you guys? How many times have we shared this in the past? This foundation, this group of workers, this apostolic age workers that are going to work during seals, this apostolic group, they are what? They are the foundations on which the walls, which represent the 144,000, are going to be built on. You following? The foundation are the revelation of the 12 apostles, which are the apostles that are going to work, the chosen, plus those disciples with them, that are going to be those in the apostolic age. This is the exact same foundation as we find in Hebrews 6.1. And why it's telling us in Hebrews 6, 1, not laying again the foundation and the foundation of what? Are you ready for this? Not laying again the foundation of repentance. Okay? Not laying again the foundation of repentance. Do you remember what we spoke about in the last video? How that, that great little nugget, maybe last video or, or two videos ago, we spoke about this great little nugget of understanding. You see, we're in an age right now in relation to the baptism that we are as Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And we're going to touch on it a little bit more later. Where we are all to be baptized, Jew and Gentile alike, meaning believing Jew, all right, a Messianic Jew, and Gentiles are like, we are all to be baptized in Jesus Christ's name for the remission of sins and the receiving of the gift of the Holy Ghost. We're going to get into that a bit in the, in the portion of the other baptism. <clears throat> but what I wanted to show you, which we spoke about in, the, in a previous video just recently, is that when we come into the commission at the end of Luke's gospel, all right, there's a commission at the end of Luke, at the end of Mark, and at the end of Matthew. Now, in our end time eyes, we know that this group here being represented is a representation of the apostles and disciples who are going to work seals, all right? This is that group we were just talking about. They are going to work seals. So we can look at it and say that that the Acts 2.38 and all that, that portion for groups being taken is done with. Now, it, you'll see it's not all done with, but it's done with in the sense that from the time the Holy Ghost came in the original Acts chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, until the time of the escape of the bride of Christ, Anybody who comes to the belief of Jesus Christ is to be baptized as 238 of Acts. 
Do you know not a single person in all of Scripture was baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost? Not one. But we've all been taught from Matthew, so that's what people have thought. It's not true. We'll, I'll clear that up for you guys very soon. So if we know, which we do, that the Gospel of Luke and the end of Luke, the bride has been taken, okay? The bride has been taken. She's the one who's watching and praying and diligently seeking the Lord. She's been baptized in his name for the remission of sins and having received the Holy Spirit. She's gone. Where did she go? As you guys know, like I mentioned at the beginning, where did she go? She went to the third heaven, the one that is like a rapture, which is what? In Christ. Above 14 years ago, which is going to be this spring. We don't need to go through the numbers again. You guys can go get the book, download whatever, or watch some of the videos that will explain it for you. And this bride is gone. So when the bride is gone and that worker group in Luke is now working the time of seals to wake up and bring in the church, where do they go? They're going to paradise in the was raptured. Okay? So if they're going to paradise, guess what? Why didn't they get to go if they were if they believed now they could fall from their faith. They could just refuse and become uh, Muslims and, and believe in Allah and they could denounce Christ. You know, we would call that having believed in vain. But nobody knows it when you're with a Christian. Right. And then they suddenly turn. And if they go and believe in Buddha or whatever else, do you think they're going to be you think they're going to be raptured or do you think they're going to be taken in the escape? No, there is a there is a belief in vain that can happen. And these scriptures I'm going to share with you are going to prove it. So this group was baptized in Jesus Christ's name for the remission of sins and the receiving of the Holy Ghost. But this group for the rapture, which is the end of seals. They're not going to the third heaven. It's still part of the kingdom of God is where paradise is, but they don't get to go into the third heaven part. They're going to paradise. So guess what? Check this out. This is what we shared, we touched on, but I'm going to add to it from the Hebrews 6. This is what we touched on a couple videos ago. This is the reason why the commission given in Luke chapter 4, uh, 24, it says in verse 47, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name, in his name, among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Any baptism going on here? Remember, we're not saying, okay, now go into Acts 2, and then, then, then there's going to be the baptism. No, we're looking at it as Luke, the end of Luke, which is a worker group that's going to work seals. Then we're going to look at the end of Mark, which is a worker group as the 144 that are going to work trumpets. And then at the end of Matthew, you're going to look at a group and they're going to work the millennial reign. But do you remember now what, what Hebrews 6 said? See, not laying again the foundation that was laid during the seals, right? During the, the tribulation of seals portion. Not laying again the foundation of repentance. So we don't have to go again and lay this foundation of repentance again. And what did we see in Luke? During the seals, this, this worker group, this apostolic age group that's going to work this period of time, listen to what it says. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached. What is it? Repentance. There it is. There it is, repentance and no baptism. Why? Because those that were baptized were already taken in the escape. You see, as we get into that portion, you're going to see that those who who were clean, right? Who's, who, whose hands and those who were clean, 
compared to those who had to clean them during the experience of tribulation. We shared that in Psalms 18 compared to Psalms 24 in relation to the end of days in the chapters to years of Psalms. So you see, we see no baptism, but we see repentance and remission of sin. That's because the this group that is going to be working and doing this is bringing people in for paradise. Now you say, yes, Alan, you spoke about that a bit a couple videos ago. Well, it gets better because in Hebrews 6, it said for repentance, right? As if, as if the foundation laid and the spiritual foundation of repentance is done, so let's not bring it up anymore. Well, guess what? That's exactly what happens. Because when we get to Mark, what happens in this Great Commission to Mark's group? First of all, this is this is this is going to begin to blow your minds because as as we're talking about the baptism a little bit here, it's going to switch to the two strikes. And then we're going to go back to the baptism again. It's 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 the evidence of the understanding, the revelation of understanding of what Hebrews 6 is telling us. All right? There is a lot in Hebrews 6 going into Hebrews 7. So first of all, now we know that this relates to the end of seals, all right? And a group that's going to be given this commission, which we know represents the 144,000 that are going to work trumpets. So here we are at the end of seals, like I was telling you earlier, right? The pre, mid, and post. Here we are at the end of seals, just like everybody says, ah, the, those who believe in seven years, the 144,000 are sealed, then it's the rapture, and then it's it's Jacob's trouble, the seven years. That's correct, except it's not seals and trumpets. It's only seven years of trumpets, and the first three and a half years, the Lord is here, and they're rebuilding the city and the streets and the temple. There's a whole seven-year portion of seals that has been missed. You see, now we saw from the end of Luke, and the end of Luke brought in Mark's group, and now here we are at the end of Mark. And at the end of Mark, this is the group that's going to work trumpets, Matthew's group, and they represent the 144,000. Now, why did I say there's an interesting part? He unbraided on them, meaning he, he, he lashed out at them for their disbelief that he was coming, for their disbelief that was given by the two witnesses that showed up first to tell them. These 144,000 are like, nah, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. This is the type and shadow of him appearing to two of them in another form and went to tell the residue, the left behind, and in this case, the 144,000. Well, listen to what he says to this group. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Verse 16, Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he which believeth not shall be damned. So for one, we have the baptism being brought back, which wasn't there for the church that was going through seals because they're going into paradise. The baptism isn't going to be needed or necessary during the time of seals, especially people fleeing and living in the wilderness and, and all the craziness going on. They're going to need the water they get. But what do you notice is missing here? And I just noticed this as I was preparing for this video this morning. What's missing? Repentance. Repentance. Look at this. In Hebrews 6, it's telling us that to not lay again the foundation, which is seals, of repentance, which guess what? Is also seals. The foundation of repentance is what is being laid in the spiritual sense of the building during seals. When we get to Mark, Mark's group is going to go work trumpets and he doesn't tell them anything about repentance. There's no repentance. It's believing and being baptized. They shall be saved. Do you, do you start to see how messed up this is when, when we're looking at the Gospels and trying to understand 
well, why does Mark say this at the end? Why does Matthew say this at the end? Why does Luke say this at the end? The revelation of who the Gospels are speaking to brings about the clarity. This baptizing that's taking place, you're about to find out when we go into it, a little bit later, this is the baptism for the dead. Hello. It's going to blow your mind. It's amazing. When we get into Matthew, how about going to Matthew? Let's go to Matthew 28 and their great commission. Look at what it says. We know Jesus has returned and he tells them what? You're to teach all nations and baptize them. But their baptizing, baptizing is in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe whatsoever I command you. And I am with you always until the end of the world. Why? Because the Lord has returned. This is the end of trumpets. He's returned. There's no, there's no remission of sins. There's, there's, no te- uh, there's no none of it. There's no preaching. Only teaching. Why? Because the whole world will know he's here. He will have been like light from one end unto the other. The whole world will know. So these guys are going to be sent to go out and teach. And the baptizing that they're doing is now going to be in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Not a single person in all of Scripture was baptized this way. Only the churches who of all of these generations have never understood who the Gospels were speaking to and have been teaching us in a Gospel of Matthew format in a baptism that is for the millennial reign. Wow. But this piece here, going back to Mark, So you see, in Mark and in Matthew, there was no remission. There was no remission of sins. It's done after seals. It's done after the church going in the rapture. But look at this in Mark again. When I said he unbraids on them. You know why this gets really interesting that he unbraids on them? Because he doesn't do that in Luke. He doesn't do that in Matthew. Okay, We've broken these things down in Mark, uh, Luke, Mark, and Matthew many, many times in who they're speaking to, and the end time eyes understanding of it, okay? He unbraids on them. We know that this group that he's unbraiding on, that that he that he's giving heck to for their disbelief, relates to the 144,000. Now, what I'm about to get into with you in relation to the 144,000 is going to be, is going to start to blow your mind even more. Because what, I've been, like I said earlier, that I that I had as, as a video, I've had in the background for a long time, and I just keep pushing it forward, is, again, something, maybe I'll do it for the next video, is I'll get into the Gospel of John a lot more in the, in the, in the chapters that relate to trumpets, all right? There's the Gospel of John. Here's the chapters that relate to trumpets. Well, we're going to get into those in a future video, and you're going to see a conversation between a, a group of people that it looks like they're, there's something of a falling away that happens with some of them. Not all of them, but with some of them. And we're going to get more of this clarity here as we read up on this, as we go back to Hebrews chapter 6. <clears throat> so now we know Hebrews chapter 6 is the end of the six seal time frame. Okay? We now know what this means. Clearly, we know what this means. And then we get to verse 2. And it says, Of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying of the hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. This is another period of time. This is a period of time that is trumpets now going forward. This brought it to the end of seals. This brings it to the start of trumpets. And what do we have now in trumpets? Mark's group. Mark's group who's working. That group chosen at the end of seals. And what does it say? They're to go and baptize, right? And then at the end, for those that are going to work in the millennium reign, they're going to baptize, right? The two baptisms. Now, here's the question. The baptism that's taking place in Mark, at the end of Mark, that they're to go out and baptize with, during the time of trumpets, which baptism is it? Well, it's the baptism in Jesus Christ's name. 
Remember, who's there at the end of seals? Who's there at the end of the sixth seal? The Son of Man, the Lamb is there, right? Remember what happens? He's going to be standing on Mount Zion with the 144,000. They have the Father's name written in their foreheads. But do you know this group is that group that he unbraided on at the end of Mark 16? It was the 144,000 type and shadow. Remember, these guys are the wall builders, right? They're the ones that, that are building the walls, the, the, the spiritual wall during the time the walls are being rebuilt when the city and the streets and the, and the temple is being rebuilt in the wall. And spiritually, it's also the wall, which is why there are 144 cubits for the walls over in Revelation 21. <clears throat> These guys are the trumpets workers. But they've been given a power that you're going to find ends up going to some of their heads. Guys, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Watch this. Okay? So there's a baptism that when these guys are going out and they're baptizing, baptizing people, the first half of trumpets, we know they're just rejoicing and they're casting out demons and they're baptizing people in Jesus' name. Jesus is there. Of course they're going out baptizing in Jesus' name. Okay? They're, they're doing the proper Acts 2.0 uh, uh, baptizing. All right? The Acts 2.38. Okay, and this is what's going on, and they're doing it for the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> You'll see when we get there, man. This I said this was a heavy, deep, awesome, incredible video. I wasn't kidding. Okay, we're gonna get to this. So remember that the the mark workers or the those chosen at the end of mark which are the 144 who are going to work during trumpets they're going to be baptizing people and doing all those things during the first half all right and when they're baptizing them the reason for the baptisms during that time is for the resurrection of the dead you're going to see when we get to it <clears throat> but listen to what happens in relation to this group there's something that's going on with this group. It says, and let's continue now from Hebrews 6, verse 3, down to verse 6. And this will we do if God permit, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they, if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucify to themselves the Son of Man afresh. Re-crucify. Oh my flipping goodness, there it is again. But here comes clarity. Who is this group that has received all of this power? This powers of the word of God, the powers of the world to come. Not just the, not just the word of God. Not just partakers in the heavenly gift of the Holy Ghost, but the powers of the world to come. Who is this group? If we consider where we're talking about here, we're in Hebrews chapter 6, right? The end of seals. Who comes in at that time of the end of seals? That's right, the 144,000. Remember we just showed you? What was the end of Mark? The end of Mark is when the Lord comes at the end of seals is the type and shadow. 
And when he comes at the end of seals, boom, who does he choose first? A group of 144,000. That group who what? Look at what he tells, look what he tells us about them in Mark 16. Uh, da, 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 da. He says, uh, these signs shall follow them which believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak in new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. What does this group have power like? Like Christ. Like Christ. And who is this group? This group, if we go to Luke, if you guys remember, Luke knows all things. So he doesn't only talk about the bride. He will talk about a group for Mark. He will talk about groups within Matthew. Do you remember this? We've taught on this a long time ago. It says, and he appointed 70 other also, right? And they're to bring in, help bring in the great harvest. So these are workers. These are the 144,000 being represented. And they're going to help the group that worked during seals. They're going to help bring in the rapture group because the laborers were few. And so there's a greater group being sent out to bring them in. And listen to what happens. <clears throat> they return to Christ. So where is this now? They've gone out. They've brought in that group. And now they're gone out. Okay? They're gone out. They're gone out. And then it says what? And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus tells them in Luke 10, verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan fall as lightning from heaven. Where is Satan falling like lightning from heaven? Mid trumpets. Where is mid trumpets? This is where Satan is falling as lightning from heaven. Okay? So this is telling us that these guys are now coming back to him at mid-trumpets time before Messiah is cut off. Remember, Messiah's got to leave. He's got to, or be cut off in some sense. Well, what did we just read? That because of these guys, there's this cutting off being taken place. What ends up happening? Well, listen to this. In verse 19, so now Satan, he's seeing him being cast down like lightning. And Jesus tells them, as we continue in Luke 10, starting in verse 19, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and scorpions and over all the power. Hello. Over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Guys, did you hear that? This group, when Satan is being cast down, is going to receive power that cannot be defeated. But they're men. How well do you think that's going to go? Then listen what he tells them in verse 20. This is, this is, the, this is a part of the clue. Notwithstanding, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Okay? That your names are written in heaven. This here, as we continue, I'm not going to go into this part. This will be part of what I'll get into when I do the John one. All right? When he says, thank you, Lord, for having revealed that unto babes, because now the Lord's being cut off. Okay, but this group is being given extreme supernatural power to the power ability of Christ. Where the enemy, including Satan and all of his minions, cannot kill these guys. What do you think that's going to do to them? What do you think? Uh, how do you think some men might react with that kind of power? Right? How do you think some men might react with that kind of power? Some might get a little puffed up, right? 
Think about it. You're going to have the power of Christ. Satan can't even defeat you. Some of these guys are going to have a little bit of a puffed up issue. We already saw when he came and and he unbraided on them at the end of Mark, uh, at the end of Mark for that group that's going to work trumpets. And when we saw here where they were in Hebrews, those who tasted that power and had these powers in this world to come, what happens if some of them, what if they fall away? The only way to get them back is if Christ is crucified again. Do you understand why? Do you understand why? But rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Do you understand why? Because they have their father's name written on their written in their foreheads. They can't be left. They were already promised. They were already told their names were written in heaven. Do you want to know who this group represents? Are you ready for this? <clears throat> Actually, let me continue with a little bit of this and it'll bring us right into it. Watch this. If we continue now in Hebrews chapter 6, after all of that incredible revelation, we're going to get back to this resurrection of the dead too. And we follow all this through and we begin to understand why this is being said about this group that has this power that's given to them. Look at what happens at the end of this chapter. Hebrews 6 verse 20. Where are we at? Clearly you're going to see this is the end of the sixth seal. Verse 20, Hebrews 6, verse 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of what? Of who? Melchizedek. Hello. This is the first place Melchizedek is mentioned. Here is Melchizedek in chapter 6 which we've been showing is directly related to the end of the sixth seal. And at the end of the sixth seal in Revelation chapter six, it's when the lamb, when Jesus shows up. So what happens in chapter seven? He would be here, right? Just like Christ. He's now here. It's that one year. 144,000 are being sealed. The rapture group comes in. That type and shadow of Melchizedek is here. So what happens if we go to chapter 7? Boom. This, for this, Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings. Why do you think coming back from the slaughter of the kings, brothers and sisters? Because all those who gathered at the at the Lord's coming at the end of seals, at the end of the sixth seal, they all stopped the war that they had against each other, went back and organized to come against the Lord, just like Second Ezra tell us, tells us. They all turn and they come to fight against them. They're terrified, but they come to fight against them. But it was the slaughter of kings. He defeated them, obviously. Okay? And as we read this, check this out. Now consider in Hebrews 7, verse, uh, verse 4. 4, 5, yeah, 4 and 5. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Who are the tenth of the spoils, brothers and sisters? Not the bride. We're at the end of seals. This is in the seventh year of, of the land of rest, right? This is in that seventh year of the Lord being here. What's the tenth of the spoils? Levi. Levi. So this man, right, this, this Melchizedek, who's a type and shadow of Christ, even Abraham gave him a tenth. 
And who are they represented as? The Levites. Well, who do you think the 144,000 are? There's all the tribes, but within all of the tribes, there's who? The Levites. Okay. Who received the office of the priesthood and have commanded to take the tithes of the people according to that of the brethren. Uh, da, 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 da. There's really good piece I want to show you. Okay. Watch this. Let's keep going. So it's all about Melchizedek here. And where are we? We're in chapter 7 of Hebrews. Well, in chapter 7 of Hebrews, maybe we should be able to find a connection to chapter 14 of Genesis, which is the same time frame. Okay? Watch this. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek, Jesus, and not be called after the order of Aaron? I just got my chills just whoo. I don't notice it too often anymore. They happen so frequently. But this was, this is huge, brothers and sisters. Remember I told you I had that shower moment last night and I was praying, Holy Spirit, please allow me to remember this. Allow me to, to plan this out and remember it when I get back downstairs. Because I don't go to bed till 2 or 2.30 in the morning. And so I made a couple notes. And then as I was coming down today, I was like, oh my goodness. Check this out. When we go into Genesis chapter 14, okay, we've opened the book of Genesis to chapter 21. We know that it's the same time frame as Hebrews 7. And in Hebrews 7, it's about Abraham and rescuing Lot. We see that there was the 12th year, the 13th year, 12 years they've served, okay? Think of those, the, the church being captured, right? The tribulation of seals. And in the 13th year, they rebelled. So in the in the chapters to years, in the 13th year, they rebelled. Okay. In the final year of seals of the tribulation portion. And in the 14th year, which is the equivalent of the chapter they're in. It doesn't go to the 15th. It doesn't go to the 16th. What do we see? Here's the battle in relation to Abraham that we were just reading in, in Hebrews chapter 7. Saying and telling us the 14th year, but not the 14th year in our in our final 14, but in the big picture, 14. See, 14 and 7. What do we have? 14 to 7. Guys, this is stuff we, we already had laid out before greater revelation even shows up. We understood parts and pieces of this before. And look what we have. Sodom and Gomorrah. So God, Sodom and Gomorrah, and what, what ends up happening? They're defeated. And the veil of Siddim was full of slime pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and there they remain, uh, 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 and they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and they took Lot, Abraham's brother, uh, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods. And then what happens? Abraham puts together his own army of his own what? Trained servants. Think the 144,000, type and shadow. And he goes after and he pursues them. Okay? When he pursues them, what happens? Look at verse 16. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot. And his goods, and women also, and the people. What do you think this is? This is the type and shadow of the 144,000 joining in to bring about the great, the, the, the great multitude, the rapture group, in. This is in the seventh year. It's in the seventh year when the rapture group happens, when the rapture happens. 
Do you recognize anything? Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed, Lot coming back, right? Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah being defeated, and then Lot coming back. What's the type and shadow? The type and shadow is what Luke told us in chapter 17. Remember we said it's the second time? Listen, for those that are newer and didn't understand this or know about this, this is when the disciples, they're asking Jesus, you know, when is it going to be? When when are you going to come? When is it going to be established? And he says, as lightning comes from one end unto, uh, of heaven unto the other, so shall the Son of Man be in his day. This is when he returns, feet down. But in verse 25 of Luke 17, he says, but first, he must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, and married, and given in marriage until the day Noah got in the ark. But what is this? If, if you follow the chapters to years that we're talking about that were revealed to us, we see Noah and his family getting in the ark. And then we see here the story begins of the destruction and the 40 days coming to an end. This is the escape of the bride, them getting in the ark. We come down here and what do we see? This is relating to the defeat of Sodom and Gomorrah and, and Lot's time and Lot being rescued and his family and those that were with them. Well, that's rapture time. Look at what Luke 17, 28 then says. Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought and sold. Why bought and sold? It's the type and shadow of them having been through seals the mark of the beast, buying and selling. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained down fire and brimstone. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. When is the Son of Man seen being revealed? When he comes at the end of seals. Hello. <laughs> when I say the books have been opened, guys, the books have been opened. It's incredible. So <laughs> let's go back now into Genesis and look at what happens in this story in Genesis 14. Okay, we got the rescue of Lot. It's the 14th year. Uh, they're destroyed and then Lot is saved. And look who shows up. Melchizedek. Melchizedek. There he is again. Melchizedek and all the ties into the hand. What is this about? Do you know the first place Melchizedek is mentioned? is in chapter 14 of Genesis, which just so happens to be the same type and shadow time frame of Hebrews chapter 7 when Melchizedek is now there. Do you think this is all by chance? This is craziness. This is, it's beautiful. But it's also a little painful. And do you know why it gets painful? Because we've shared this in the last video, or, or maybe a couple videos ago now. Do you remember this whole conversation with Abraham, uh, uh, with Moses? It's known. Look, this is a big, this is a big ministry here. Got questions ministries, 194,000 people. All right. It's been taught in seminaries. They've just never understood it. This was the revelation I had when I was in the shower last night that I said, oh, please let me remember it so that I can explain it and show it. Okay, we just what did we just see in Hebrews chapter 7? The Levitical line, the time of Melchizedek, and Aaron. And Aaron, which relates to the Levitical priesthood. Well, what happened in the story with Moses and the staff? Let's read this. Um, take the, so the Lord tells Moses, take the staff, you and your brother Aaron. Gather the assembly together. Speak to the rock. Okay? Speak to that rock before their eyes. And it shall pour out of it its water. And it shall pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. But what ends up happening? Okay? What ends up happening? Moses took the staff of the Lord from his presence. Just as he had commanded him, he and Aaron, remember, we're talking about Aaron, 
There's this connection to Aaron at the time of trumpets. Gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said unto them, Listen, you rebels, must we, must we bring you water, water out of this rock? It sounded sometimes like maybe we, that Moses was also including God when he said we. But he wasn't. He wasn't. Do you know who he was speaking about when he said we? He was speaking about himself, Moses, and his brother Aaron. He and Aaron. Must we? And you say, okay, well, that's not hard to understand. It says it right there. Must we bring water out of this rock? Do you remember what the Lord told him? The Lord told him to speak to it. Do you know why? You think maybe Christ... Yes, the, the story was this was always going to happen. It was always in the Lord God's plan. But the Lord God never told him to strike it. The Lord God told him to speak to it. But Moses says, we, meaning he and his brother. Why didn't Moses then go on scene? And then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff before the water gushed out. Now, let me ask you, when the Lord God told him to speak to it and not strike it in the first place, but he said, speak, why didn't Moses, when he struck it, why didn't he just strike it once? Why wasn't that enough? Because he said, we. He was talking about himself and he was talking about Aaron. So if one strike has already happened where Christ was struck, which is when he came the first time. And Aaron's, this was the revelation in the shower, that Aaron's was the second. And the second is the Levitical priest line, is the representation and the type and shadow of the 144,000 of who we were told That if they in their powers and forces and everything they were given and all their gifts, if they should fall away, how would they again be renewed? Because their names were already written in heaven. There'd be only one way to save them. And the only way to save them is just as we read right here. Why and where did it all come from? Moses and Aaron and the causing of hitting, of striking the rock twice. Moses caused the first strike. Aaron caused the second. And the second strike has not yet been accounted for. Yikes. What the? Do you see why I was so passionate? Why I was telling you this is a heavy one? This is going down a rabbit hole? This was incredible. I had never caught that Mark and Matthew did not also include repentance. I had no idea. I thought they all had it. I just noticed the differences in the baptism and not baptism. It had never dawned on me. The repentance wasn't there anymore. The repentance wasn't there anymore because the Lord is on Zion. And the reason for the baptisms in the end time understanding, in the end time eyes, relates to Mark and the millennial reign. This is just, this is incredible stuff, guys. This is mind-blowing, mic-dropping, head-exploding, jaw-dropping. Aaron. Aaron. Do you believe it? And it's right where it should be in the Revelation.
it's painful. It's it's disheartening. Not maybe not disheartening, but it's just it's it's so hard to believe. It's right there in scripture. Do you think we were told Moses struck the rock twice for no reason? It was just oh, it's a metaphor for Christ being struck twice. Without any understanding, or just oh, just oh, that's just because it's Aaron. The second was Aaron, and that's why throughout we see things of the hundred and forty-four thousand. It's the exceptional powers that they're given, and there's a falling away of some of them because of that power that they're they're just some aren't able to handle. Kind of lines up a little bit. Now, maybe I'll save that for something else for, for another time. But it begins to line up, you'll find, with um, with uh, 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 Judas Iscariot, Iscariot. All right. And and his time of being cut off and so forth. Um, but I'll save that for another time. Now let's bring this forward into this this information on the baptisms. All right. Not only the baptism's future, but we're still in this period of time where we're still in the baptism and the being cleansed through the through the baptism of Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Okay? For me, I I, I don't understand it. You know, there are brothers and sisters out there. I I had an, an email or a comment posted from a sister who had been following the ministry for quite a while. And suddenly, because this whole thing with baptism, she doesn't want to follow anymore and she unsubscribes. I'm like, after everything is what I'm thinking about. After everything you've come to understand, suddenly now you don't want to believe the baptism? After after the revelation of the open books, and being able to prove that the revelation of the open books gives us the understanding that it's in fact true. Proves to us that the one at the end of Matthew has nothing to do with any of us. And that everybody who has ever been baptized in scripture was baptized in the New Testament. Was baptized in Jesus name for the remission of sins after the Holy Ghost came. People will say, well... We're, we're baptized in the fire of the Holy Ghost. Yes, we are. But that has nothing to do with you dying in Christ. Okay, we're going to talk about some of those things. You're going to see. You're going to see. And the difference is, do you want to go to the third heaven? Or would you rather endure seals? Probably, possibly die during seals, which is fine. And end up in paradise or make it through and then end up in paradise? Or would you rather escape all these things now? Be be like a rapture. Be part of the bride of Christ. Having your garments clean already. Do you remember our little sister Mila? We talked about her the last couple of years. Year and a half, two years, something like that. When she had that, she was in heaven and she saw and she was in the one room. It was a great big long table and it was rewards and stuff that were going to be given there. And when she came out of that area, think of it like one area of heaven, like the third heaven. And when she came out of that area, she said she was in a big open area. And in this big open area, she saw people walking around and their white robes had black spots on them. Do you know why? Because those people are in paradise. Those people are in paradise portion. Those who get to go to the third heaven will also enjoy paradise. But those who are in paradise don't get to go to the inner portion of the third heaven. They're still part of the kingdom of God, but they won't have access into the third heaven. It's the difference between those who had washed their garments, those who were clean, compared to those who will have to make themselves clean during the time of seals. You understand, we shared on this in uh, in the teaching with Psalms. Okay, when we go to the book of Psalms, 
we see that Psalms 18 is before the tribulation begins. But when we go to Psalms 24, we see there it is again. We're lined up at the end of the sixth seal. And when we went into this, we saw that those in all this craziness, which I believe is, is the meteors coming, that just that's going to happen just before the escape. The Lord's going to come down, flying upon a cherub, and he's going to what? He's going to deliver those. All right? He's going to deliver them, set them into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. The Lord rewarded me just as just as uh, as Enoch. Uh, sorry, yeah, as Enoch. He rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. Those hands of power. Remember we talked on this before? This is the bride being taken, being rewarded in the cleanness that she has. When we go to 24, which is towards the end of the sixth seal, it's the fullness. Oh my goodness, there's the fullness again. Weren't we just talking about that in Hebrews chapter 6? The fullness of the world. Remember that. And the fullness thereof, the world that the uh, the world and they that dwell therein. Do you know the world represents us, represents the Gentiles? It's the fullness of the Gentiles. In fact, as we get going and we keep chatting and, and going further into this with the baptism, you're going to see this mentioned. So here we are at the end of seals. It's the fullness of the Gentiles. And it says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Why the hill of the Lord? Because he's come at the end of the sixth seal with heavenly Mount Zion. We've explained it and shown it so many times. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands and a pure heart. What are these clean hands? Here's the one from 18. They were already clean, pure. They were bright. This clean, blameless, clean, innocent. What did they have to do? Where does it come from? To make clean. So you had, they were clean. They were bright, gorgeous, clean hands. And the word hands means power. This clean means to make clean. And these are the ones that will have palms in their hands. Just like the Mark group at the triumphal entry. Luke's group at the triumphal entry did not have palms in their hands or any branches. But Mark's group did. Why? Because Mark's group, the, the great multitude that's going in the rapture, had to make their hands clean. And they were the ones holding palms in their hands in Revelation chapter 7. This is the difference. Where would you like to go? Do you want to be the ones, you want to have to endure to make your hands clean? And do you know why this enduring? Do you know why this portion of seals is taking place? Because it's coming to the end of the fullness of the Gentiles. Everything the Lord has to, has to cram and jam into one seven-year, six to seven-year period. Because it's the end of the age of the Gentiles forever. It was 2,000 years of Gentiles, almost. And it will be the end of it. So it's all got to be crammed into a short period of a few years to bring about the most wake-up call possible to allow them to cleanse themselves during this period and to realize the truth is in the Lord through the remission of sins, through repentance, sorry, through repentance and the remission of sin. And, and, uh, yeah, the remission of sin. This group isn't the one getting baptized. This is the group that went through seals that are now going to ascend the hill, that are going to paradise. You see how amazing this is? Which would you rather? Oh, you're going to chance to say, ah, I don't believe in baptism. It's foolishness to say that. Do you believe what the apostles wrote? Do you believe what disciples wrote? Do you believe these things that were talked about and shared by Paul? They were all baptized in Jesus' name for the remission of sins. Why would you think it's any different for us? 
It was all taking place after Christ resurrected and the Holy Ghost came. So why would you think it's not for us? Who is it for then? Do you know what people say? Ah, it's just for the Jews. It's just for the Jews. We, are, we, we got baptism by the Holy Ghost. Let me show you. Let me show you this now. Okay? People say, well, we don't have to be baptized like Paul because Paul was a Jew. Right? Paul was Jewish, so, you know, he, he, was, he was working for the Gentiles, but he was Jewish. So, Paul's not really an example that, you know, we need to be baptized like Paul was. Let, let's go look at this. Okay? Watch this. Let me see where I was. 17, 18. Oops, I think it was 9. Okay? And here's what we have. Listen to this. So we know that it was Paul on his road to Damascus. Everybody knows that story, right? The road to Damascus for Paul. He has, he's three days without sight because the Lord showed up and said, why are you persecuting my people? He ends up three days blind. He goes to Ananias. Ananias removes the scales from his eyes, right? Let's read what it says. So he says, uh, by the name for the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel, and I will show him, this is Jesus speaking to Ananias, and I will show him great things. He must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him, said, Brother, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou might receive sight, comma, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Aha! We can say, see, there you go. He believed because he got sight. That's the representation. And he received the Holy Ghost. That's what you guys are talking about. That's what many people are talking about when they say, I don't need to be baptized. I believe I have repented in my remission of sin and I received the spirit of the Holy Ghost. Some maybe even spoke in tongues when hands were laid on them. That's the Holy Spirit fire that everybody talks about. But listen to what it says next. Acts 9, verse 18. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight, come forthwith, comma, and arose and was baptized. Okay? And was baptized. But now some people say, well, okay, fine. He was baptized. But again, we find out that he was Jewish. So what does that matter? That still doesn't really represent the Gentiles, even though he worked for them. And then there's another example. We say, okay, well, how about this? What about uh, Philip? What about Philip in the story of the eunuch? It's, it's debated in the story of uh, the eunuch as to whether the eunuch because I was thinking, oh, what a great idea. Let's show the story of the eunuch as the first Gentile, and he was baptized. But as you do a study on it, you realize that the, uh, uh, that the eunuch most likely wasn't a Gentile. All right? First of all, there's a funny little joke about it, which is that the eunuch was set as the highest authority. He was given great authority over all the treasures of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. <laughs> so, okay, to me, I would say, oh, all right, that's a Jewish guy, <laughs> all right? He was given authority over all the, the treasures, okay? When you think about it, if he's given authority over all the treasures, he's given authority over all the wealth, you know, kind of lines up, doesn't it? But there's more to the story. He was coming to Jerusalem to worship. And he had the scroll or a scroll, a copy of a scroll of the book of Isaiah. Okay, the prophet of Isaiah. So first of all, he was very well educated. He could read 
and he had access to the scroll and he was going to Jerusalem to worship. So the argument might be, well, okay, Philip, uh, the Lord told Philip and Philip went and he explained and he opened the understanding to him for, for, from the prophet Isaiah. And the, the eunuch said, well, I want to be baptized right away. And so he got baptized right away. Now, Christians can say, well, see, there's still not really evidence that that was a Gentile. And guess what? I would have to agree because I'll share something else with you guys that you guys know. In looking at this with end time eyes, not every story is, but in this one, we look at it with end time eyes. And I'm sharing this for a reason. In Acts chapter eight for this story, if we go to Acts chapter eight, look where it is. It's the beginning of trumpets. Acts chapter 8 is a type and shadow is the beginning of trumpets. And so in this case, I'm looking at it with the end time eyes of trumpets. And do you know, Philip, his name is used 38 times. Do you know how many times the name Philip? It's almost like what you think. You're going to think the writer was forgetting who we were talking about. But he was making a point. Luke was making a point by how many times he used Philip's name. See, Philip, 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 Philip. Philip's name in Acts chapter 8 is used 14 times. That seems like an absurd amount of times to use the name Philip in chapter 8. But we've, we revealed this in the past, haven't we? We gave the understanding of this in the past. Philip is a representation of the Church of Philadelphia. The Church of Philadelphia, one of the seven churches. And here he is being represented here as his time to start shining and doing his work in chapter 8 as the time of the 144,000 going out and what? Baptizing like Mark's group at the end of Mark, going out and baptizing Matthew's time. So I would I would side with the people and say, look, now this Ethiopian was an Israelite or, or, or a Jew, all right? He was Jewish or he was an Israelite, okay? You guys ever see the movie? There's a pretty good movie out, actually, quite a good movie called uh, Red Sea Resort. Is it Red? Yeah, Red Sea Resort. It's a good movie, and it's about the uh, uh, part of the, the time with the, disp the dysphoria, it's called, with, with uh, I think they were Ethiopian, maybe they were another part in Africa, another country, and they part of the diaspora, right? And they were coming in. They were being rescued by, by, by the Jews. And they were being brought into the land of Israel. Okay? So we know there's all different colors and races and so forth of, of Israelites and of Jews. So I would side, knowing what we know about Philip in Philadelphia, about knowing the chapter to year representing the beginning of trumpets. And here it is, this baptism. This baptism is a type and shadow of Mark's group. Now, the, the end of Mark's group, that group 144 chosen, working the Matthew time, working trumpets as that group going out at the beginning and baptizing and doing all those things, as we read their work was to do at the end of seals, which was at the end of Mark verse six, uh, chapter 16. Okay? You remember, Philip? What if we look at it another way? Phil, uh, the book of Acts is split up into two sets of 14 as a type and shadow at the end. So if we go into chapter 21, we might also be able to see Philip about to be chosen. Check this out. You go to chapter 21 and look at what it talks about. Watch this. Chapter 21, verse 8, which is like the seventh year when the 144,000 are sealed and are being chosen before they go out as the beginning of trumpets. And look at what it says. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea and entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist. Hello. The 144,000 are the evangelist guys, which one, which was one of the seven. What do you think that means? Philip, Philadelphia, evangelist. Church of Philadelphia, one of the seven, one of the seven churches. You follow? Daughters that were virgins. Okay? 
It's the representation of the 144,000. When in the exact same chapter to year, that tells us right here, when the 144,000 are chosen. Hello. And here it is when he's out working. Name mentioned 14 times in one chapter as he's sent out. So you guys might be able to say, oh, okay, see, I told you, still not Gentile. All right, let's go a step further. Wasn't the Gentile with the Ethiopian. How about chapter 10? Let's go to Acts chapter 10, not in a type and shadow of the end, but in relation to seeing who is being baptized. Watch this. We're start, where was I? What did I mark? Verse 43. Okay, listen to this. Acts, uh, Acts chapter 10, verse starting in verse 43. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, meaning the Jews, which believed that were with that were with Peter, okay? And they of the circumcision, the Jews, which believed were astonished as as many came with Peter, okay? Those were the Jews that came with Peter. Because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnifying God. What well, do you see? This is the same story. They received what? In Acts 2.38, Peter says what? Everybody's to repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And what happened when they got the Holy Ghost? Holy Spirit fire came upon them, and they spoke in tongues. That is the Holy Spirit fire. All right? That is the Holy Spirit fire. That is the Holy Ghost fire that people talk about. And that is being baptized, you can say, in the Holy Spirit. It doesn't mean everybody speaks in tongues, but that is the baptism by fire of the Holy Ghost. And they were amazed that these Gentiles had received it. Because they what? They believed. They had remission of sins, right? They had repented, and they believed. And at the hearing of it, they received the Holy Ghost. That's what happened to Paul too, isn't it? Isn't that interesting? It happened to Paul. So what does it mean? It means you could believe in the Lord and repent for the remission of sins and receive the Holy Ghost. But there's still something missing. You haven't been washed clean. The old you hasn't died with Christ and come up a new man. That's the purpose of the baptism. To wash that away clean. And that we no longer have this repentance anymore but that we ask for forgiveness for the little things that might creep in along the way once in a while. And so we ask the Lord to forgive us our sins daily. That's what I pray over each and every one of you and your families. All that the Lord has put over in this ministry. See what's going on? So now listen to what happens. Going to uh, Acts 10, verse 47 and 48. Uh, or the end of 46 starting. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? See? So you can receive the Holy Ghost, you can believe and have remission of sins without having been baptized. Listen to what he tells them next. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. You following? You see that? Then he commanded them to be baptized. He didn't say, ah, if you want to go be baptized. That's what I'm telling you here. Ah, if you don't want to, you can wait. 
You can go to paradise and miss out on, on the third heaven. Oh, well, that's not very nice of you to say, Alan. Well, then read the scriptures. Study to be found accounted worthy, right? Study so that when he comes, he won't be like, but, but, but. It's right here. You've just been given a, a, a piece of revelation from Luke, Mark, and Matthew that I, I would highly doubt it's ever been fully understood before. Because the, the Gospels have never been understood the way they've been open to us in the end times. You see, it doesn't just reveal to us what the revelation of the end of days are going to be. That is the greatest portion of the revelation in what these open books have done. But it doesn't only do that. You see, just as the, the, the death and resurrection of Christ. You see, how many people have been saying, how many pastors, I mean, we saw Chuck Missler and Perry Stone and all these guys. Because they teach from Matthew, they think Christ had to be in the grave three days and three nights. He wasn't. That is a future event. We showed the 40 days of the Son of Man as Jonah, that he would be as Jonah was. Well, Jonah was a warning. Jesus did not yet do that. At his resurrection, he did not go, on, go around and giving them warning of destruction that was coming. He didn't go around and do that for the 40 days as Jonah. That's still to come. But the church, because they didn't understand it and knew the Gospels and why there were these differences, they say that that was the Son of Man is 40 days after his resurrection, and they say he was three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. But what happened? The end time revelation revealed to us that it was in fact from when he was being taken, then crucified, and then resurrected on the third day. Which means what? Which means the three days and three nights in the belly of the earth is still to come. It's still to come. You following? It's still left to happen. We don't know that exact time of that's going to happen yet. But it's still to come. That's what it means. You see, watch this. <clears throat> In Romans 11, let me go to Romans 11. Starting in verse 11. Remember, there's this, there's this other baptism, this portion that we've talked about. And it's how many of us believe because, have believed because in a seven-year revelation, people, they, how can they get it? How can you understand it in a seven year when your foundation is all in Matthew? They either completely miss it or they bundle it all up together and it's all confusing. Listen to what we're told here. In Romans 11, starting in verse 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid. But rather, through their fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles to provoke them to jealousy. That's why I say to the Lord every night in my prayer, Lord, use me, bring, use me to bring them to jealousy. All right? To bring them to jealousy that they will wake up and come back to you. We know that time's coming. But listen to what he tells them next. Remember I said the world, remember that, that the world, when we saw the fullness there, the fullness of the world, which related to the end of seals, which related to the end of the Gentile time. Listen to what it says. Romans 11, 12, verse 12. Now, if the fall of them, Judah, okay, of the Jews, be the riches of the world. You see? Be the riches of the world. So their fall became the riches of the world. The Lord God allowed them the riches of the world for their fall because they're still his people. And so what happens? Well, now they get criticized and condemned a lot, don't they? Well, because they're fallen. They have fallen, but while they've fallen, and even though they're in wickedness and all of these things, they are still the Lord God's people. He gave them the riches of the world. 
He gave them to be the most Nobel Prize winners. He gave them the, the wealthiest of such a small group of people on the earth. He gave them the riches of the what? Of the Gentiles, the riches of the world. And the diminishing of them, the riches of the Gentiles. Because of their fall, in the meantime, he allows them the world. And while they get the world, it's the building up and the richness spiritually of the Gentiles, the time of the Gentiles. For what? How much more their fullness. So meaning when the time of the Gentiles is over, how much more is he going to reward or, or give or do? How much more is he going to do for his people? Okay? It became the riches of the Gentiles. And if the Lord God did all this for the Gentiles, how much more is he going to do for the fullness of his own people? When at their fall, he literally gave them the world to, to run into the riches of it. Okay? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, okay, to provoke those gen the, the, the Jews to, to start seeing it, and might save some of them, okay? What is this saving of some of them? Well, remember, the bride and, and the escape of the bride isn't just the Gentiles. There are also going to be Messianic Jews that came to believe in Christ as well, that will have been baptized in Jesus Christ's name for the remission of sins. It's why Luke chapter 21, when we shared the, the parable of the fig tree and all the trees, the reason it's in Luke only is because it will be a grouping of both of them. It'll be the 10,000 times 10,000 and the thousands of thousands. All right. And then it says, for if the casting away of them, okay, the fall for the Jews, be the reconciliation of the world. Remember, I told you the world. If the falling away of them, the Jews, be the reconciliation of the world which is what we were just reading, to the fullness of the Gentiles in Psalms 24, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Okay? What shall their reward be? What's What greater thing did I say I would do for them in their fullness than I would do for the Gentiles? during their time of riches. Well, didn't you see what happened to the riches for the Gentiles, brothers and sisters? We go to the kingdom of God. We can go to the third heaven, or you can wait if you want, <laughs> or you can go to paradise. But what's he going to do for them? He's going to bring them back from the dead. Hello. How much crazier is this going to be than people vanishing than the graves to open up and his people from centuries past rising up? What? Oh, you better believe it. That's what it's telling us. Check this out. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Watch this. this it's, it's so mind-blowing. It's so incredible, okay? Check this out, 24 through 29. Watch this. Afterward, they that are coming, verse 24. Then comes the end, okay? So if we start in, even in verse 23, but every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards they that are Christ at his coming. This coming is the literal same word for coming, which is found in Matthew. In fact, let me show you this, watch this. In all of the discourses, okay, out of the discourse of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's found only in Matthew's discourse. Check this out. Okay, we're not talking about where everywhere it's found, but only in the discourses. There it is. Out of all of the Gospels, out of all of the discourses, out of everything, it's found four times in the Gospel of Matthew relating to the coming feet down on the Mount of Olives. Okay? So you see what I'm saying? This is talking about his coming feet down on the Mount of Olives at the end. 
Listen to what it says. So at the end of the sixth trump, uh, the end of the sixth trumpet to the start of the seventh. Verse 24, 1 Corinthians 15, 24. Then comes the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. Okay? Remember this? The end of, uh, of uh, Matthew 28. The Lord, all power and all rule and authority is now given unto him. Same as we read at the end of uh, at the seventh uh, trumpet. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he that have put all things under his feet, uh, but when he saith all things which are put under him, it is manifest that he is expect which put all things under him. Uh, verse 28, And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son, of, then shall the son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Here it comes, verse 29. Else what shall they do which were baptized? What shall they do? Otherwise, this is Paul speaking, don't forget. Else what shall they do which were baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all, why are they, why are they then baptized for the dead? Baptized for the dead? A group being called they who will be baptized for the dead? What on earth is all this about? Being baptized for the dead, check this out. It gets, it, it, it's pretty wild, guys. Okay? We covered how Luke, Mark, and Matthew and what they speak about, right? We just saw a little while ago how Luke is going to work till the end, till the fullness of the Gentiles come in. And we're, we're shown <clears throat> and we're told specifically there's no baptism. There's no baptism because they're not going to the third heaven. They're going to paradise. And in paradise, there's going to be people with spots. Those black spots are the dried blood of Jesus Christ over their sins. Okay? They never got baptized. And during this time of seals, there will no be no need for baptism. Okay? But now watch. We showed a little while ago how the 144,000 and them doing their work, especially in the first half, it says that people are to believe and be baptized and they'll be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, what about the baptized? Why is it only him that believe, but there's missing the baptized portion? We know that this relates to the this group, the 144 that's going to work trumpets now. And now this baptizing is happening. Well, first of all, what baptism is it? It's the Acts chapter 2 baptism still. Remember, Christ is going to be on heavenly Mount Zion. The 144,000 will have met with them. Right? They, they'll have the Lord's name written on them. They're going to be out baptizing, casting out demons. Right? Nothing's going to be able to kill them. Okay? And they're baptizing. But who's being baptized? Well, it's during Jacob's trouble time. It's during Judah's time. So it's the Jews being baptized and coming in. Did you see what it, what it was just saying in Romans 11 and, and in 1 Corinthians 15? That there's a baptism for the dead. This is that baptism for the dead. For them, for they. This is their baptism. Remember, in the end time eyes, every single person in the earth from now until the escape is to be baptized as Acts 2.38. But then during seals, there's no baptism necessary anymore because they're going to the third heaven. Uh, they're going to paradise. They will be spotted. They're going to endure that time of seals. 
where they're cleansing their own robes. They have to be made clean. They have to make themselves clean during the experience of what they're doing. To be tested, to be to be renewed, to be strengthened and commit to the Lord regardless. In death or to survive to the time of the rapture. But then baptism is, being baptized is brought back again and saying if they don't believe, they'll be damned. But there's still a baptism that happened. What's this baptism for? It's the baptism for the dead. It's the baptism for the resurrection of the dead, which is for the Jews, which is for Judah. Do you want to see how awesome this is? Check this out. In Matthew 27, remember where we are. If the end of Mark is what brings us into Matthew, and it's the time, Matthew is the time of trumpets, look what happens. When we get to this point of Matthew 27, we have the story of Christ's death and resurrection. All right? This story of death of Christ's death and resurrection, <laughs> first of all, is related to after three days. Hello. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> but we know that this is the type and shadow. Just like I shared with you guys, if you guys watch this video, after you watch the intro videos, of course, right? After you watch the th these three videos, you come and watch this one, this pre mid and post and the revelation of the three of the pre mid and post relates to the triumphal entry, the transfiguration and the resurrection story found in Luke, Mark and Matthew. The resurrection story or the, the death, the crucifixion and the resurrection story found in Matthew is in relation to Christ returning at the end of six years of trumpets or the seventh trumpet. As we know, after he had been cut off. All right. And look at what happens. Hello, this is another mic drop for you guys. Matthew 27, 51 through 53. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. By the way, in Mark, it was only ripped a little bit in the middle, by the way. That's for the bride to get taken out through. But now it's ripped from top to bottom. And the earth did quake and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the city and appeared unto many. Don't you get what this type and shadow is? Don't you understand what this is? This is those who were, there was a group being baptized during the time of trumpets and whether they believed and then if they didn't believe, the baptism was still being counted because the baptism was for the dead it was the baptism for the dead, which was for who? God's people promised the resurrection from the dead. What is the type and shadow of this period? It is the exact type and shadow in the end of days revelation of understanding. It is the type and shadow of right here at the seventh trumpet. When the Lord has come, everything is his. And look at what it says. And the nations were angry at their wrath has come, the time of the judge. Here it is. And the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest reward thy servant unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints that uh sorry, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Who are those that are destroying the earth? It's those that he's going to destroy in Zechariah chapter 14 who came against Jerusalem and who came against his people. Who are those being resurrected? What is this type and shadow? Who are, who are part of this resurrection of the dead? Well, here's a great example we've been given. This brother of ours is still lying in his grave waiting for this day. What happened with the story of Daniel? Okay. It, the entire book of Daniel 
Daniel 12, verse 13 says, But go thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and shall stand in thy lot at the end of the days. You know what he's a part of? He's a part of the resurrection of the dead. Did you see that? Who was the one? Who are those being promised the resurrection from the dead? His own people. There's a baptism being given for them to be resurrected from the dead. And Romans 11 told us that, hey, if my people fell away and I turned all of this to the time of the Gentiles until that time was over, how much greater is it going to be? How much more spectacular is their fullness going to be but life from the dead? Do you see why this has been so confusing when you when everything's been taught from Matthew all of our lives? Everything starts to come into order when we understand who the Gospels are speaking to, when we see that there are two sets of seven for the end of days. Now let me finish it up and prove this out in Matthew. Because you see why it's... Check this out. You want to see this? <clears throat> we see that this resurrection, that, that those who come out of the grave at the end of the six or in that time frame of the seventh trumpet, in the seventh year when the Lord is here, the resurrection of those that slept and the baptisms that happened. You see, when did the baptisms, when did the baptism start? At the end of Mark, at the time of the start of trumpets. And guess what? At the resurrection of Christ, at the type and shadow of Christ's return, there's going to be those who will resurrect all of those who were his those who were promised, they will come up out of their graves, brothers and sisters. Daniel and all those guys, they will come up out of their graves. And guess what? You want the evidence that this is from the baptism of Mark, of those being baptized through trumpets period, and these being resurrected at the end? We're not even at the end of Matthew. Hello. There's still one more chapter in Matthew. The chapter in Matthew, which is chapter 28, then goes on to the final great commission. This commission shows that Jesus has returned. All power and everything is already given unto him. There's no resurrection of the dead here. They've already been resurrected. This is to the end. This is a group now that is going to be given the great commission to go out during the millennial reign. And they're going to teach everybody and baptize nations in the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And they're going to teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even until the end of the world. The resurrection of the dead happens from the baptism at the end of Mark, which will take place during trumpets and will be the resurrection of the dead that was promised to them of his people and still had nothing to do with the final great commission of being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Soak that up. <laughs> I said I had notes. I didn't even look at them. <laughs> I think I glanced over twice, and I, I didn't even know where I was in my notes anymore. You see, I have my prayers for the Spirit to lead as I've got these things, as I'm understanding it, as it's all coming together. And I, I tend to get little tidbits that just push it and, and, and build it all together and, and, and just tie it all up as I'm spending an hour or two before I actually do the video to, to put all the final pieces together. Man, this was awesome. I don't know about you guys, but whew, that was jam-packed, guys. That was jam-packed with revelation. And to think, man, that, that first portion... 
that portion we were talking about with um with uh Aaron, I mean, my goodness, I keep saying I'm not going to da- I'm not going to go down that trail. I just and and I'm telling you guys, I am not going to do a full fledged video on it. Um, I shouldn't say that because the Lord's in control, but no, I'm not. Unless He literally tells me Himself, I'm not doing it. But here was another piece. I know there's many of you out there that have been following this and, and understanding some of it uh, along the way and have seen these things for yourselves. Now add that to the mix. Add that, and there's there's literally no doubt. I mean, something is about to happen in that period of time, which has been revealed from Daniel to Matthew to to trumpets to Zechariah to I mean, it's everywhere. It's all over the place. All right. So now let me end with this for you guys, because there's a lot of people that want to know about this. And that is, this is what I send to people about the baptism. All right. So let me read this to you. And when I'm talking about the video, it's this video right here. All right. It's bride time. Is your garment clean and white? And we had our brother Richard, uh, uh, the pastor Richard here that put this together so you guys can find that video um let me show you all right i want to just share it with you because so you guys will know where it is and and what it looks like it's this video right here all right the lord reaching down in the water so let me read what i send to people so (laughs) here here's what i send to brothers and sisters It's based on situations for each, whether they have a church or at least a baptized believer that can do it. And finally, as a last resort, self-baptizing. I know the last one doesn't sound right, but I can assure you in these circumstances and the Lord knowing your heart, it can be done. See the testimony below that came from a sister last year who did it herself. This is from Sister Renee. This is what she sent me, by the way. This is the email that came from her, this portion here. She says, after watching the video you had on baptism for the remission of sins in Jesus' name, I instantly had a feeling I needed to be baptized. Being that I am alone now, I baptized myself. The Holy Spirit then guided me. I felt the Spirit and fell to my knees and asked the Lord for forgiveness of all my sins and prayed for a while. Then I went to my sink, filled three glasses of water, and poured them over my head as I prayed, Dear Lord, I baptize myself with you as my witness for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. I instantly felt a tingling through my whole body. I walked over to my door and looked up to the sky. I started to speak in tongues, which I have never done. It was uncontrollable, and even if I would try to st- I stop it, I couldn't. I began to shake and cry uncontrollably. I felt this for a long time. Then a feeling of peace fell over me. This was from Sister Renee. You see, brothers and sisters, it's not that we say everybody should be self-baptizing. It's that we're in a situation in the world right now and churches and the persecution in the church of trying to open and and churches in many cases, not even you say, I want to be baptized. They say, well, come back on uh, May 27th at 4 p.m. And we'll what? They don't all do that, but most do. All right. You can't be waiting for that. You don't know what tomorrow holds. We want to be baptized right away. And in many cases, churches aren't even open. In many cases, you can't go to a friend if you're alone. And that friend, maybe they're not even baptized. So you don't want to have them baptize you. You need somebody baptized in Christ to baptize you. But if you don't have it, and we're in this limited situation now, you see, if the Lord knows your heart and he knows you're desiring it, he knows you want to be baptized. He knows that you don't really have this option easily available to you. If you do it with the right heart and the right spirit within, he will hear you, all right? This was the evidence for me. I had prayed that the Lord would let me understand that it was possible for people in the right heart and in the right spirit to baptize themselves. 
And this was the email that I received about it. All right. So it validates that it's possible done in the right spirit. This is the video that I say. And everybody in that video, by the way, you can skip the first 30 minutes and go to when we start talking about baptisms, which is when you would see this like 32 minutes in. All right. And so here's the info I say about the baptism that I sent to people that ask. I would say if you have someone nearby who's Christian to have them baptize you. But if not, then do this to yourself first. After you do, then baptize your family. Okay, for those that may have family uh, in their home as well. Fill the tub, preferable, or start the shower. Don't treat it like a shower or bath, but be dressed in a t-shirt or shorts or whatever works for you. Then do one of these to yourself and repeat to your for your family. Again, do not treat this as a bath or shower. Wear shorts or a t-shirt, for example. Once the water is ready, proclaim you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior with all your heart and say, I repent and in Jesus Christ's name, I am being baptized for the remission of sins. Then dunk under the water or get in the shower and get all wet. Then come out from the water and say to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then turn off the water if the shower, get out, and you're done, dry off. Say it with all the love you have for him, and he will hear and receive you. And then I said, um, when you do it for your family members, they can dunk under water and so on and so forth. Now, again, you would repeat that for your family members. Now, we also had people that were in parts of the world where water wasn't easy, okay, where water... They, they don't turn it on except for every two or three days, sometimes maybe even a week, I think. So to be able to just get in the water isn't the easiest thing either. So if you have bottled water, then pour a small bottle of water or a glass of water and pour it all over yourself. Pour it from the top of your head and let it come down. All right. The Lord knows your situation if it's not possible any other way. All right. But do it in the right heart. Do it in the right spirit. Doing it in Jesus Christ's name for your love for him, and you will be received. You see, don't put it off. Don't think, I don't have to do this. I showed you Gentile, I showed you Jew. We are both to be baptized as Acts 2.38 right now, until the time of the escape of the bride. That is the baptism. And it always will be until the Lord has returned feet down. That is the baptism. You following, brothers and sisters? Please don't let this, don't, don't let something of like the baptism that in your declaration for the Lord, that you just say, ah, I don't need it. It's not for me. Why not? It was good for everybody else in scripture. Don't delay. Get baptized. Brothers and sisters, I pray this has blessed you. I pray this was just a, an incredible revelation of understanding. And I have no doubt that it's most likely going to be something that you're going to want to watch more than once or twice and uh, ask questions about. Come and join us in the forum. Don't forget, go and get the free app for as many as are left. And put your comments in the, in the, in the comments question. Put your, your questions there. And uh, we'll see what we can do to answer them to the best of the ability. And Prayerfully, in the next video, I will go into more of, of this conversation of the 144 and, and what more detail of Hebrews and John tells us about it that will connect to this first half of the video and really, really uh, show you that this group is, is in a little bit of trouble at some point. All right. So, brothers and sisters, I love you. God bless you. I pray this has been a blessing to you. We'll talk to you again soon. Bye for now.